Um, I felt that I wanted to just really talk about how I um, saw uh, the practice that I wanted to make, the scales that we were going to work in, and the kind of areas that we were going to engage in. And essentially for me, um, making Agile Associates was about trying to um, create a series of platforms that would allow me to um, yeah, specifically look at um, topologies, the way in which topologies are shifting and hybridizing in the world, new scales of buildings, new dimensions of buildings um, that are about the products of um, the modern world, the late 20th century and the ability that we have with technology. Um, working at small scale, finding small scale interventions, addressing the relationship between artists and looking at research, not just as a, a sort of a, a reflection on the produce of the modern world, but really to, I wanted to go back and, and to look at conditions of urbanity in the world and to try and understand those conditions and to try and learn lessons from them. Um, this was our first contemporary art um, institution in Denver, Colorado, and it was the first project that brought us to the US, actually. Um, essentially, we, we um, saw the idea of a contemporary um, Kunsthal as um, uh, a return, instead of, uh, you know, looking at the kind of whole trajectory and the sort of uh, Roger's piano model of the ultimate flexible blocks with interchangeable systems being one extreme in the paradigm, maybe moving back to the idea of the studio, the artist studio, the recreation of the artist studio and the paradox of the urban conditions that you have in the city as a, being the frame in which most contemporary art is made as maybe the proposal for experiencing um, uh, uh, contemporary art now. So we, I took this idea of saying we would make three buildings and then in it a series of rooms. The rooms would be analogous to the studios that you would find artists have, either sometimes toplet, sometimes window, sometimes clear story, and that those would be programmed to then have this, uh, this way of playing back. It, it forced the institution to have a very different uh, curatorial agenda because essentially they always have to work with these rooms which are more or less fixed. Um, uh, so it, it, and, it, and, it, and it sort of changed the way in which that programming would, would work for that institution. It was no longer about build and set, it was about these rooms and then working within these rooms as a, as, as the prime sort of relationship. Plans, very simple. Um, it was about what, um, shifting uh, the sequence so that the, the main volumes are here, here, here. Um, a ramp brings you around and into the center. A stair takes you in and then you wrap around on the outside. So you coil into the center and then you wrap around the outside and then these are the rooms that you go through, the basement and then up above. The section really playing with that idea of the ramp, the lower stories, the volumes and the key spaces, and then the upper roof. Um, this is the building in its context. The form of the building really is uh, uh, just, a, it's a really a wrapper. The idea of creating, um, Denver is a mile high above um, sea level, extraordinary light. So how to kind of create an architecture that was about um, doing two things. One, dealing with this extraordinary um, solar gain, but two, creating an architecture that would maximize the use of that light also into these spaces. So these studio spaces we wanted to kind of fill with as much light as possible. So really the main quality of the space was not the reliance on artificial light, but on as much daylight into these spaces as possible, but to then make a, a, a form which essentially is also uh, a, a sort of plenum exhaust, which basically takes the heat gain not to the core of the buildings, but allows extraction to the terraces. So in a way it becomes another climate moderator, a sort of plenum system that wraps the building um, and, and, and takes the first hit, but also then dissipates, you know, discharges the energy, but dissipates the effect of that energy as a kind of resource for the space. Um, this is the entry in. Again, this idea of trying to dissolve the boundary of a door uh, became a kind of a preoccupation in this project. Um, the ramp that takes you up, the doorway inside. And then the center between the volumes. The studio rooms where um, you have window architecture illuminating as much as possible on the lower levels. 
axes. Um, then the chamber, which just looks back. This is the library, which looks back to the main space. The volumes on the upper level as you go around. And this is that uh, plenum where the extraction of heat is happening behind this polypropylene screen, which is self-supporting, and these framed window moments. And, and this is allowing us to have about 50% of the light transmission into the space, so you never really need to light these spaces. Um, and, and then you have the main gallery spaces with skylights um, that are reflected lights of different geometries and scales. So really a kind of contemporary art space that's about this idea of this incredible elevation and harvesting it and this uh, everyday way of looking at art with these uh, ways in which clear stories, windows, etc., create conditions. Then it has a garden on the roof with a cafe. We also built the house next door um, for the, one of the patrons of the of the of the museum. Um, I will now talk about the, the housing, and housing was really very much a very important part of the beginnings of the practice, and it wasn't traditional housing, it wasn't about um, uh, housing in the traditional sense, but it was really trying to work with projects that were responding to specific conditions, or projects where new hybrid situations were occurring, were very interesting to me, so I really reached out to those kinds of uh, uh, those kinds of projects. A very dear project to me is um, the response to Katrina um, in New Orleans um, um, when the, of course, the tragic flood happened and the images that we all know very well. And the Ninth Ward was really this place that was very much decimated and uh, this foundation that Brad Pitt sort of uh, set up, uh, organized to create um, um, uh, create uh, a response, an architecture. It became a kind of a zoo, in a way, of, of responses. But there was something very earnest about this idea of trying to make an architecture in this space, which was really trying to deal with this culture, geography, uh, climate uh, discourse that was starting to happen in my mind. And in a way, these are one of the, this was one of the first tests of that sort of consciousness. Um, these are obviously the images we all know. But when we started to work with this, I started to very much think about these images and, um, and you know, what we're looking at are slave cabins, um, urban slave cabins and, and, and sort of commercial architecture in, the, in, in parts of New Orleans. Um, one sort of sought to kind of say that maybe um, a response in this kind of condition was to, was to kind of take everything and almost um, invert every process, so things that were divisions become um, support, things that were shedding become collectors, things that were low become high, um, and we almost, as it were, reconstruct the, the parts of what a house is, um, um, but we reconstructed in a new image. So the kind of typical primary image of the box with punched holes and a roof and maybe a kind of porch all are there, but they're reconfigured another way. And it's about this idea of saying, well, okay, if that is about a kind of industrial mass produced form that simply just wanted to kind of make things in an efficient way to create housing. This is the image again, tooled up to respond to climate, place and culture. So we actually took the geometry and proportion of um, those slave cabins and, and inverted those um, to become storage and structure, etc. Things like um, the initial studies were about, you know, taking the roof and reversing it to collect rather than, you know, all the things that we do now that we take for granted. Um, issues of cross ventilation, etc. But essentially, um, we uh, this was one of the first prototypes. The house becomes this um, this. Uh, inversion of uh, the, the idea of making um, this home so that the upper plane actually 
um, becomes this new respite, this first floor. And actually, climatically, when you come up to that first floor, the, uh, you suddenly move away from the still air that's at the lower ground to this incredible, you realize that New Orleans at just above sort of 15 feet has these extraordinary cross breezes, which are really, really amazing. And all the kind of architecture of, uh, of the sort of colonial sort of core center created that upper story attic, which is where you had the kind of bucolic aspect. So this idea of making in low cost housing, this aspect became important that the middle band is the accommodation, the upper band becomes the life where this inside outside world can exist. And then depending on what can be afforded, the height of this um, becomes um, a way of dealing with the 500 year floods, 100 year floods, or, or, or just allowing your services to be underneath. So at its smallest, it becomes these, uh, these are the kind of minimum flood, floodplain um, dimensions. And then this upper story really becomes a respite if there's a flood, but also becomes this flexible space. We, we got images where people were getting married up here, and, and it's extraordinary seeing these pictures with people using this new um, space that's given um, in an in a, in a extraordinary way. Um, we, we allowed the builders to efficiently just keep um, refining the form. So we start sort of here, and now we are somewhere here. And, and we sort of beg to say that this really probably is the right response in this climate. Um, and how do, we get, how do we get the housing to move towards that idea of being much more specific about uh, creating something uh, in this manner? So some later ones. And just looking at different generations, there's several of these now being built. Um, we have about a dozen, I think, in that landscape. And it's, it's interesting, to see, interesting to see the evolution of that construction and this idea of this, uh, uh, this, this form as a, as a landscape. One of the original ones uh, that um, uh, Greg talked about is the Dirty House, um, which was an important test. And in a way, that was also a test about how to kind of uh, create some condition out of this uh, part of the East End. This is the East End now. Some of these images are down, some before. Um, and it was really how to make uh, criticality in, an, in a context of warehouses where um, there was a lot of, um, in, there was a, this is uh, the part of the East End where a lot of manufacturing was and is. Um, it's now light manufacturing, but there was a lot of heavy manufacturing. It was very much bombed during uh, World War II because of the heavy military manufacturing that was in this area. So it had a lot of open sites, a lot of opportunity, but also at the same time, a lot of uh, sort of post Thatcher years, this, this became a site where a lot of industry left and a lot of this housing was being rezoned and this idea of how to reuse um, this sort of uh, stock. I became very fascinated at this time with this place in London, not to build a new building, um, cause, I mean, we could have done, and um, this is what my client bought. Um, and uh, we, you know, and usually the planners were like, okay, tear it down, just do whatever you want. And I, I became very fascinated with this idea of saying, well, that would be easy, but actually what, what could be a strategy to try and really discuss this idea of a, um, a system of reuse, a repositioning of this kind of stock, um, uh, and, and could we create and another value that was talking about a layering within the city, these dense metropolitan cities, um, uh, could we make a new typology within that? Uh, the artists of Tim Noble and Sue Webster, they wanted a home and a studio. Um, so this also presented a very interesting uh, uh, scenario. This was really the proposal in the end. And the proposal was really to build that, all this roof, was really the architecture, then to create a new lining, um, to create these two volumes. Um, uh, there's really a 10-foot volume and a 20-foot volume. And really, this idea of how to efficiently create um, a series of chambers that were proportional and scaled to create work and home, and to kind of play with this idea of volume and aperture and horizon became the way in which one would re, um, sort of recapture this old stock and create this new sort of uh, reuse from the sort of urban produce of the city and how planning works and how you did things. Um, 
this is what the building became. Um, and really it was about uh, this recoding of the language of architecture from uh, you know, using planar mirrored glass on the bottom flush, creating sort of a discourse about this kind of um, the way in which you can play with this uh, materiality. So this is a flush mirror system, then this is fixed on the interior, but because of the new steel structural lining, it has this sense of you know, lightness and weight. This is half a meter deep. And then the roof is held on a, a glass wall, compression glass wall with little rods in it. So there's no columns in it. The plane of this uh, structure is really held on this new glass uh, structure. Um, and this is the new construction up here with this new form. And this form just follows the distortion of the volume. Again, uh, internally, sectionally, um, the building is, um, there are these layers, the layer of the kind of existing reuse and then the, the new structure that internally organizes the spaces. This becomes the important threshold, which creates the relationships to the spaces for art and then upstairs to the, uh, the residents. So you get um, the sort of the, the niche, which is flush on the outside becomes a sort of edicular from the inside and unflushed on the inside. And then up above, the, the roof becomes the plane that's supported on the 60 millimeter glass wall um, with this very high parapet, um, which then allows it. Uh, and at that time, there were no neighbors. So this was actually the height of Sue. It was the, sort of her dimension. So she could, they could use the inside outside in a very kind of porous way. Um, um, and, uh, the lighting really, apart from the strip lights that are in the space, is really from this indirect lighting in the corner, which then creates this nighttime halo and then creates this relationship. So again, this idea of how to find a kind of meaning in the engagement and, and to create something that creates a position is it was sort of underscoring all these things. Um, last project, um, the project we're doing right now in um, DC, um, the project is about um, the history and the contribution of African Americans to the very idea of America and to create and to understand this very distinct history from the Middle Passage of coming from Africa to this present day, this unique story, which actually is very much the lens at which to understand the modernity and the modernizing power of America. Um, in a way, this project's is really a sort of symbol. It's a museum and a symbol. Um, and to, to create, we said, because of the position of the site, which I'll show in a second, a building which was between a monument, uh, it was between a monument and a building. It was oscillating between the two. And a project which had to, in its very profile and silhouette, signify its content specifically. Um, this is the site. Um, if you don't know, this is, of course, the White House. Um, and it really, if you know it, is basically at the nexus between the, uh, the mall grounds and the Washington, it's uh, uh, the Washington Memorial. Um, uh, it's, it's the mall and, uh, uh, and, and the grounds coming together at this junction. It really creates a kind of neck, a, a junction, a knuckle. Um, and it's the closest building that will be to um, Washington's uh, needle. This is um, the building when it is completed. It's a 210 foot cube with this um, bronze skin and this chamber. Uh, the canopy is on two columns. It's uh, just under 60 feet. It's 50 feet. It's a 50 foot cantilever um, with this bending reflecting pool. Um, then the chamber, the entry hall with um, it's, uh, it's sort of axiality and this idea of this compression that brings you in and wood, metal outside wood, um, interior, sort of almost reverse forest. Then the cavity down into this perimeter, which is where the skin is, which is also the kind of the system which brings in light. And when you look up, you realize that it's all just a cluster of sky, it becomes skylight that each one of these returns ziggurating as skylight and then 
content. Um, this is um, uh, some of the experiences um, in the lower ground history galleries, the middle passage. That chamber um, that will have, this is the 60 foot wall with the chamber and the uh, reflecting space in here. Um, this is the Pullman car, which just got fitted. This had to be put in whilst we're building, and here it is. So that had, that's just been placed um, in the chamber. Um, and this is the, the oculux. This is the kind of reflecting space that's coming out. This is uh, one of the early renderings of that chamber, which is a reverse uh, waterfall, and it really is working. It's, it's a quote from Martin Luther King, this idea of rainfall as justice, um, this idea of the power of water as a cleansing, justifying uh, element. Gallery spaces, exhibition spaces, the building from Constitution and the construction now. Thank you very much for your patience.